Hi Platform, I'm Kat Ellis, the author of Harrow Lake, and these are my top five book-to-screen horror adaptations. So Harrow Lake is a horror thriller about Lola, who is the daughter of a celebrated horror film director. She thinks that nothing can faze her because she's grown up, you know, surrounded by horror stories. But when she arrives home one day and finds her father has been brutally attacked in their New York apartment, and she is sent to stay in Harrow Lake, which is the town where one of his biggest horror movies was made, she finds actually things can scare her. She's there in this small, isolated town, full of superstition and local legends about monsters, and this one particular monster called Mr Jitters, and she starts to get swept up in this horror and realises actually she might not get out of there alive. I grew up flicking through my father's VHS cassette collection, you know, watching the big franchises like Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Hellraiser, all things that a child really shouldn't be watching, but I think that has definitely been an early influence on why I love horror so much and why I decided to write it as an adult. First on my list is It, chapter one and chapter two, and were based on the Stephen King novel of the same name. Of course, there has to be a Stephen King on this list. It, if you're not familiar with it already, tells the story of a group of childhood friends who call themselves the Losers Club and they live in a very small, weird town called Derry and it's a town that is being plagued by a killer clown who comes out every 27 years to feed on the locals. That's something that I wanted to, to play with a bit as well in Harrow Lake. The, the town has so many facets to it, so many hidden creepy things that everywhere you look there's something that might scare you. So that's something that was definitely on my mind while I was writing it having a town that becomes like an entity of its own. When I was watching it in the cinema, um, that first scene where you actually see Pennywise down there in the storm drain, I could hear like an audible gasp in the cinema because even though people sort of were expecting it, because I think everybody kind of knows that scene from you know the previous adaptation, it's just so terrifying that yeah, it absolutely sticks with you. I think it did so well because of its really iconic villain. That's something as well that I wanted to emulate when I was writing Harrow Lake. I wanted to create a really unique villain, uh, somebody who really will terrify readers and stay in their mind long after they finish reading the book. And I think with Pennywise the Clown, that is obviously, you know, the iconic image. A killer clown that people just aren't ever going to forget. Next on my list is The Hole, which was a 2001 film. It was based on a book called After the Hole, which came out in 1993, and it tells a story of four teenagers from a private school who decide instead of going on their organised school trip, they're going to go instead and spend a weekend in a bunker underground and they have another friend called Martin who's supposed to come and let them out after the weekend and of course Martin doesn't show up. You find out right at the beginning that um, one of them is staggering out all covered in blood and something terrifying has happened so it kind of flashes back to tell you the story of what happened there. I think the differences between The Hole and After The Hole, both great titles, was that in After The Hole you have Martin who is a point of view narrator for the story and his version of events differs a lot from Liz who's the main narrator in both the movie and a big section of the book. Um, so you get the, these two differing versions of what actually happens while they're trapped down there. But Martin's largely taken out of the film, so you see things much more from Liz's perspective. But even so, you have this real unreliable narrator thing going on where is she really telling the truth about what happened down there? So in the whole, you get this sense of real, true isolation. They are trapped and that sense of being isolated, being very much unable to get out away from what's scaring them. That's something that I wanted to explore as well in Harrow Lake because Lola is very much trapped there when she goes to stay with her grandmother. She has no phone, no way to get out of town by herself. And you know, she's staying with a grandmother she doesn't know. She has all these new faces who aren't trustworthy. Uh, seem to want something from her, so she doesn't know who she can trust. Next on the list is Lock and Key, the recent Netflix series, which was based on comic books which were written by Joe Hill and illustrated by Gabriel Rodriguez. The show has just come out, but it's like an immediate favourite for me. It has a slightly lighter tone than the comics do, but takes much more of a, a dive into the family dynamics between the Locke siblings who go back to their father's ancestral home, Key House, 
and they start finding a series of keys which have strange powers and unlock doors, like one locks a door that lets you go inside your head. The comic, I think, in tone, it was much darker. Uh, there's a lot more gory violence in the comic, which is, you know, great from a horror perspective. They tone some of that down for the series, but I think it works really well because it focuses more on the family dynamics. It takes a deep dive into the lives of the Locke siblings. They didn't really leave much out, but they did change quite a few things. Um, the keys themselves, they have different uses in the comics, so some of them have different powers, and they've created some different keys for the series, like the fire key didn't actually exist in the comic books. If they bring back you know, another season of Lock and Key, I think they'll probably be discovering a lot more keys hidden around the house that they'll be able to use. Another one of the differences between them, uh, there's this iconic image in the comics where when they use the head key on Bodhi, uh, you see the inside of his head on the page and you know it's that representation changes a lot in the, the filming of the series where when you use the key to open somebody's head it creates a, a separate version of the character and they open a door and are able to travel inside that way and there's a different representation of what's inside somebody's head. So I really like the difference there between how they interpreted what was in the comic and what actually made it onto the show. I think you know the fact that they've decided to adapt it as a series works really well. They've based it on the first collection of comics and there are several more that they can work with for seasons two onwards hopefully when they bring it back. I think it's one of the things that works really well with it being a series is that it gives them the time to explore the characters that maybe you, you can't do so well in a comic and I'm really liking getting to know the three Locke siblings as they're showing them on the series and I think that's going to get better and better as they you know hopefully bring it back. I think if Harrow Lake was ever adapted to screen I think it probably worked better as a film. There are so many hidden elements to it that are actually just encapsulated within this one story and I don't think there are too many unanswered questions at the end I hope. Going way back for the next choice on the list it's the 1940 film of Rebecca by Alfred Hitchcock and it's based on the book of the same name by Daphne du Maurier. This film was one that I watched time and time again when I was growing up and I have to say that it's been a big influence on me when I was writing Harrow Lake. It's about this young woman who marries a, a much older widower and he goes takes her to Manderley, his ancestral home. She's following in the footsteps essentially of his seemingly perfect first wife but once she gets to Mandley, she starts to uncover all these secrets about Rebecca's past. And she realises that actually Rebecca wasn't so perfect and maybe she didn't die as accidentally as she has been told. One of the things that I love so much about the film Rebecca is that when the new Mrs. De Winter gets to Mandley, she realises that everybody seems to be hiding something. And so as she you know, is uncovering all these secrets, she's learning that first Mrs. De Winter isn't all that she was made out to be. And the idea of uh, uncovering secrets in a new place is something that I wanted to explore a lot in Harrow Lake. When Lola gets there, she's uncovering secrets all the time. And as an author, that's something that I really love to do, be able to you know, reveal these secrets at key moments and really surprise readers. One of my favourite and the most creepy scene in, in Rebecca, I think, is the one where Mrs Danvers is leaning over the new Mrs De Winter's shoulder and urging her essentially to jump out onto the rocks below. Obsession is one of the key themes to Rebecca and I think that's one of the things that makes it so creepy is how obsessed everyone is with Rebecca herself and the new Mrs De Winter is finding herself, you know, really lacking in comparison to this idealised version of Rebecca that, you know, she's being bombarded with. And the idea that, you know, people have this idealised version in their minds, it doesn't really give her a chance to prove herself. I think the idea of this obsession, this insidious obsession, is something that I wanted to bring to Harrow Lake as well. The people there are obsessed with Nightjar, the film that was made in Harrow Lake. They're obsessed with Lorelei, the star of the film, and Lola's, you know, vanished mother, who they all expect her to try and live up to. So she's very much, you know, in the same situation that the new Mrs. De Winter was in, having this idealised version of somebody that she has to try and live up to. Last on the list is The Haunting of Hill House, the recent adaptation on Netflix 
which was based on Shirley Jackson's novel of the same name, but does differ quite a lot from the book. It's about the Crane siblings who go back to Hill House, the, the house that they spent some time in when they were younger, a terrifying place for them that they vowed they would never return to, but they go back there as adults when one of the siblings dies there. The novel was quite different in that it sets up uh, Hill House as the haunted house where paranormal investigators go to examine exactly what's going on there, so there is some difference there. But that was one of the things that I loved about the series is that it brings a real family dynamic to it. The family dynamics in Hill House are really interesting in that they're, they're quite, they're a close-knit bunch when you first encounter them as children in Hill House, but you know, obviously the traumas that they go through, they send them very much on different paths. I think reading a horror novel gives you a slightly different dynamic with the story than just watching it on screen. It allows you to really get into the minds of the characters and it lets you see things from different perspectives. When you're watching a film, you're seeing it from the director's perspective. But when you go into a novel, you, know, you can get into the heads of different characters, you can see things and interpret things as you want to, not just as they're presented to you on a screen. In The Haunting of Hill House, um, you find it's very much uh, steeped in sound, that you know there are these creepy noises, the dogs barking, and banging on the walls at night. The music as well that they use for the series really helps bring that tense, scary vibe to the show. But that's something that I wanted to translate when I was writing Harrow Lake. It, the sounds that Lola encounters in Harrow Lake are very important in creating that, that sense of you know, growing horror. Jitterbugs, these little uh, like bug in a nut. She hears them tapping their legs inside their shells. She hears uh, tapping on the walls at night. She hears uh, the chattering of teeth as well, um, especially when she goes into the caves and she hears like this sound, like building sound of chattering teeth. The sound of horror, I think. I wanted to try and create that on the page somehow, so hopefully that worked. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite book-to-screen horror adaptation would be. If you want to find out more about my book, Harrow Lake, there's a link in the description. And don't forget to subscribe to Platform for more bookish videos. Mm -hmm.